Thank you. I thought that um, I wouldn't talk too much about snails because if you want to learn about snails, I can point you in the right direction. Book that I've written or join the Conchological Society, which I'll come up to later. But I'll talk about how to become a specialist with reference to um, those snaily type things. So I started a bit about myself in, in some way, a little bit odd that. I started my archaeology as a schoolboy, and before I went to university, I was directing a dry valley excavation, doing geoarchaeology, doing environmental archaeology. Geoarchaeology was hardly even used as a, as a, a name at that stage. And then after doing a PhD and BSc, where I'd done bits and pieces in between, um, I was able to do work with Martin Bell, so I had a mentor who taught me through some elements of that. Then I worked at Wessex for 20 years, and then for the last 10, 11 years, I've been running my own consultancy and freelance stuff. So um, what we need to think about is, if you want to be a specialist, what route do you want to go? Or what sort of things do I think you need to do? And I think there's a number of those things being brought out today. And one thing is you cannot be a nine to five um, jobs worth because you will not get on. You've got to use a bit more now, apart from the nine to five, and do a bit outside that framework and then you stand a chance of getting into what is a fantastic field. But I think that as a specialist, you need to be competent in two disciplines. You need to be competent in the field of archaeology and your specialism. There are a number of people who are very good at snails. I can give you some of the leading snail people in the world, but they will be no good in archaeology because you have to use that to address archaeological problems. Um, pollen is one of the key areas which we can see this in where a lot of palynologists can produce fantastic pollen reports but at the end of the day a lot of our archaeological colleagues will go away bored because it is telling us about the vegetation history and I don't want to know about the vegetation history I want to know about people in the landscape and I think that that's why as a specialist you need to dice with both the specialist field and make sure you're integrating that with the archaeology after all um, as a specialist you should have gone beyond talking to other specialists. You should be talking to specialists in order to get that skill. But ultimately, you need to understand the archaeological framework because you must address archaeological problems via your specialist field. And I think that's one of the key things. You can't just go out and lock yourself in a box and learn about snails or pollen and so forth because you are working with archaeology. And so I consider myself a geoarchaeologist, perhaps an environmental archaeologist, which is exactly where this boundary comes in, and a conchologist. But first and most of all, I'm an archaeologist. And in the dim and distant past, I might actually also admit to having been a beaker pottery specialist, but we've glossed over that for a minute. So as a specialist, you have to, you have to satisfy the two audiences. One, the audience of your specialist field, and secondly, the archaeologist. And you need to acquire the satisfaction of the former, so, but you always need to write for the latter. So you need to be sure that you are good enough to report to your peers that you know you're about your discipline, but ultimately it's not them that you're trying to impress. You need to write your report so it addresses archaeological questions so you're writing for the latter. And that's the way I think environmental archaeology and geoarchaeology will move forward rather than being a sub-discipline just looking down the microscope, looking at snails or so forth. And things we need, and we've heard before, are things like training and mentoring, facilities and equipment, and report writing, and the audience, the audience you're writing for. So many of us might write snail reports for an archaeological audience, but we might then write snail reports or bits on snails for a paleoenvironmental or a Malaskan audience. You need to be really clear for whom you're writing and when. So the audience, who are you doing the analysis for, and who gives you that acceptance? It's the specialist from whom you acquire the competence. And then maybe many people get hung up with that. And because they've learnt this specialist skill from some of the greats, some of the, the, the mentors, you know, we've heard people talking about having learnt from Mark Robinson. And I always suggest that if you're going to be an environmental archaeologist or geoarchaeologist, you want to choose one key specialism, you should never divide yourself up amongst a whole range of them unless you're called Mark Robinson or Pete Murphy and so forth. Um, and then, so you might be talking to the environmental archaeologists and the conchologists, but remember that the archaeologist is your target audience. So although you may get your skills from those former groups, it's the archaeologist you're talking to. And the process, you need to learn the skills. And then you need to apply those skills. And I will stress this again, it's the archaeological colleagues. And the reason I say this, I'm an editor, uh, of a number of series for 
Oxbow and for the Conchological Society and for the European Society of um, Ecology. And a number of people who write for their sub-discipline when they should be writing for the archaeological discipline, the archaeological audience, is huge. So how do you get started? Well, there's nothing better than to start reading old reports, seeing how people have written things before, see how people have tackled things before, and see the way forward. You need textbooks to look at identification and all that stuff called theory, as well as interpretation. And then perhaps the most important thing is to have access to a reference collection. And that reference collection needs both modern and archaeological specimens. And actually the reference collection is perhaps the heart of any specialist's work. That reference collection needs to be tre treated with reverence, it needs to be curated, it needs to be collected, and it needs to be kept very clean and careful. The amount of reference collections I've seen in universities where there are clear specimens that were previously identified correctly that have now been mixed is, is a huge thing that you need to be very wary of. Um, I can name seven universities, I won't, that I've been to in the last eight years where their reference collection for snails have been mixed and there are students using that reference collection to misidentify things. Even my own reference collection I go through every two years or so and check that everything really is in the same tube. It's absolutely imperative if you don't have that material collected and curated properly you're going to be at the bottom end of the, of the scale. And the other thing is that if you getting hold of a reference collection is something very difficult. There are places where reference collections are available, but for many um, disciplines, you're going to have to go to either a university or an archaeological unit. And things like snails, there are very few. Cardiff is perhaps one of the best collections in the country, but that means you may have to dash all the way to Cardiff Museum, book yourself in and book time. So that is something you need to be very wary of um, uh, and treat with great reverence. Um, laboratory space, most environmental work can be done with limited laboratory space, sieves, buckets and a microscope. And the other most important thing about learning your discipline is get out there in the field, look at the ecology, look at the stuff for yourself. Don't just be clinical, working in the laboratory, working off the texts. Um, John Evans always used to tell people to get out in the field and see the snails in the field. See how they're interacting with the plants. See how they're interacting with the landscape so that the textbooks you read will come to life and you can understand those in three dimensions and hopefully with the archaeology you're going to understand it in the fourth dimension of time. So it's really important to go to join societies such as um, Association of Environmental Archaeology, the Conchological Society of Great Britain, uh, the... Uh, other geological and soil societies that you can get out into the field, meet with other people and actually see this stuff in the field. And then find a mentor, we've heard this before. Actually either find a mentor or find someone you can work with who will mentor you and who will give you that time over and above their, their work unit to give you some guidance. We've all, or a large number of us here, have actually had the fortune of having people there who've been able to give us time um, energy. I was lucky enough to have Martin Bell, partly because I stumbled across him as a schoolboy digging at Bishopstone, only just down the road here when I was a 14-year-old excavator uh, at that stage. He then disappeared off into this side of removing his way from archaeological sites, digging this fantastic site with Neolithic pits and Bronze Age enclosures and Iron Age enclosures and uh, a lynchet to doing stuff with soils and sediments, and I thought he'd lost his mind. Uh, um, now I realise that actually um, having now, ironically, then spent much of my life working in subjects very allied to him, he became, that was a mentor that I was lucky enough to have. So what do you need? You need a laboratory and laboratory facilities. This is my own, it's purpose built. I built my own facilities when I left Wessex. But essentially, all you really need is access to a sink, some sieves, and a clean, methodical workspace. And for most environmental work and for snails you need a reference collection, a microscope and some good reference books and someone who will check your material. So how do you get started? One is most important, get involved. Get involved with what other people in the profession are doing. Get involved through the Association of Environmental Archaeology with Snails, through the Conchological Society, 
get involved with other practitioners, get involved with other archaeological societies who may be doing excavations and you can see what they're doing. So there's those two again that I mentioned. Um, and get involved with the archaeological profession and field work. There are a number of people who think that they can just go off and learn their specialist skills on their own in a cupboard, reading the books and with their own material, but I think you really need to get out and engage with people who are doing that sort of thing. And quite clearly for uh, land sales and for most geoarchaeology, you have to understand deposit formation and deponomy. There's no point just taking snail samples from deposits uh, without understanding how they form, because 50% of my interpretation for land snails comes from the formation uh, of the deposit and the deponomy. And I find that uh, there's, a, there's a survey in my, in my book which shows that a, a number of archaeological units, archaeological archaeologists, have provided me with samples, and they've been taken following John Evans's maxim of, of 10 centimetre intervals. That was a guesstimate for a useful interval through a uniform deposit. And people have been religiously taking samples at 10 centimetre intervals through deposits, avoid missing, I'm sorry, crossing horizon boundaries, and just stacking it right through. And that's, many of those samples have been useless. In some cases, I've only found out afterwards when I found one case where the deposit which had a Mesolithic and medieval within one sample. We only found out through processing it. Uh, so on after processing a huge program of 48 samples and assessing them. And in fact, getting your specialist on site to do that would have saved them in that case about £8,000. Um, so you need to understand your deposit formation, whether you're doing the specialist work or actually just being a very good archaeologist. And the other thing to do is observe specialists in the field. And in this very small picture, we can see this young man here, uh, John Evans, taking samples at Maiden Castle. And so if you have the opportunity of going out and seeing people working in the field, seeing people sample, seeing people in the laboratories, do so. Sometimes that opportunity is, is quite difficult to find, but it's up to you as the person out there wanting to make that career to make those things happen for you. I don't think you can expect everything to fall into your lap. You do have to be uh, show some initiative. So I've now got three slides which just show what the main routes are. So one, you need to get your mentor, do a lot of background reading, get involved. The field ecology, I think it's really important to get out and understand your deposits, understand the ecology of the snails, understand how the geoarchaeology works, how some of this gets there. Join the various societies, go to meetings and meet people and talk to people. I went to Conchological Society meetings to find I was sitting next to Robert Cameron and some of these great people. I'd read their texts and things, and you were sitting there saying, Oh, who are you? And they're at the meetings as well. I'm more than happy to talk to you. See the sampling on site. Sometimes you can get involved in helping with the sampling. If I'm on site being brought into a site to do the sampling, many of the archaeologists are too busy to even give me an assistant. If someone is interested, you want someone to help write the bags, help you label things how you make sure that things are done in sequence. That's a phenomenally good way to learn. And I did that um, assisting both John Evans and Martin Bell on their sites. Again, that's finding the mentor, finding someone, may not be a single mentor, but people who can, you can follow and who can help you. And that's the late, great John Evans. Identification. You need a reference collection. You need access to the reference collection. And that is so important. I have seen... Um, in the past, the Conchological Society did a review, and in the past 15 years, we have seen 23 people come through who have started doing identifications from archaeological deposits, going to the Conchological Society, none of whom has had a reference collection. They've done it all from textbooks. Their identifications are poor, should I say it politely, because the size and the scale you cannot achieve through text. So reference collection, as others have said before, is absolutely key. Textbooks, you need to have access to textbooks, you need to have access to libraries. And I should add that it's not just the textbooks you need in learning, but you need to have access to other research papers and a good library. Some archaeological units have phenomenally good libraries, but you need to be able to go to university libraries and other libraries in London where you can have access to that type of material. But never, ever use textbooks alone. You have to use the real material. And then when you're learning, always have your identifications checked. I still today 
send my snails off to individuals to have them checked if I'm unsure. I don't find that as a problem. I just want to be sure that what I'm publishing is correct because when that data is published, we'll find that that data then becomes used by other people doing regional syntheses. And hopefully if that data is correct, those regional syntheses are going to tell us something useful through time and space. If those identifications are poor, then we're actually discrediting that entire research database and therefore that next level of research has been disabled by the failure to do to the identifications. And I've noticed a number of publications where it's quite clear that some of the snail identifications are either stonkingly important or stonkingly wrong. And they're sitting there in the text. I'm going to go back and try and get those identifications checked because I've got databases where I'm running things looking at regional pictures of distributions of things and they just fall out. So again, you need a mentor or something to do it. Um, access to established poems, reference collection. You can start building your own reference collection. Build your own reference collection right from the beginning. That's easy to do if you're starting off, you're being given samples, pull out some of those samples once you've had them identified, put them in there. I have got some of the snails from my very first ever land snail report sitting in my reference collection. They're not the best samples, but they are there and well identified. Give yourself access to laboratory space. I've got people who come and use my laboratory. Some of them use it free and I have volunteers and researchers using my laboratory. And I also have a desk which is a fee paid desk where I have three people coming in over, over the year and paying a fee to use the desk and have some training. When it comes to processing, see the processing in action. See someone else doing the processing before you read it like a recipe to make pancakes. Actually look at how other people are doing it and learn. Because as we've heard before, if you don't process your samples properly, half your samples are going to end up down the plugger. And people starting off, if you don't have access to a laboratory to do the processing, there are many places you can buy in processing. Uh, there are a number of people that do flotation commercially. So you can do that. And my final one is read the available texts. Write to satisfy your specialists i.e. your mentors, but right for your archaeological audience. And I hammer on about that because I think as a discipline within environmental archaeology, we've spent too long navel-gazing, and that's why we some of our reports are becoming slightly more introverted. Keep a full archive and field records and lab records and weights of everything you do and make sure that's sitting in the archive and that goes into the archive so other people can see what you've done and take it further. And I also think that all your material, just like your finds, all the finds and animal bones go into the archive, but so should your plant remains, so should your snails. Um, I've said that a bit before. Um, but then when we get out into the field, we have to remember that we can't just do things routinely, that sampling is about understanding the geoarchaeology. You have to understand the deposits to understand the intervals you're sampling. So here we have John Evans sampling at Maiden Castle, and this is mine recently in the Stonehenge landscape. They are all taken at different intervals to reflect the deposit, uh, the speed of deposition and the nature of those deposits. And at the end, if you, I haven't told you much about snails, but if you do want to know <coughs> any more about snails, you can just buy this book, which I'm flogging here, for 20 quid, which is five quid cheaper than you can get from uh, Oxbow. Um, and if you are interested in snails, here we have a large snail. This is a large, complete adult snail, which came from Avebury on Saturday from our geoarchological work there. And you can, I'll pass this around to show people who perhaps don't know about snails. They see this snail here. This is, this is the Roman snail. The Italians brought it over to eat. You can eat it. The French do eat it. If you go to France and you go and get the Burgundian snail, it's a big, big blonde snail. It's fantastic. If, they, if, you, if you look on the menu, it says pretty green. That's that one. That's the common garden snail. Yeah, you can eat it. They are okay. You can eat those too. Um, so this is a land snail. This is adult. Uh, he's probably Neolithic, and he's complete. Um, and he's one of the, not one of the smallest species in the British fauna. Yeah, that little speck at the bottom is the snail, <laughs> which is why we have to take samples for snails. You can't pick them out. Um, and the, for those people who are interested in snails, there are. Luckily, I did snails because I'm not that bright, and there are only 118 species of snail, and lots of them are slugs. And if you go to the Conchological Society, 
you can buy this for a couple of quid and this is all of our wonderful snails and if you are even more sadly interested you can buy the book and that's where I'll shut up and allow you to ask questions or... Thank you.